Um, hi everyone, thanks for, for coming and uh, thank you to our organizers for all their hard work. Um, I did change my subtitle, um, you know, there's pick, pick your scene. I changed it from Anthropocene to Capitalocene, but you know, fill in whatever scene is your, your favorite there. Um, so um, I actually wanna start a little informally today by sharing with you all um, where I'm coming from. So I work at a public teaching university located on Gabrielino, Tongva, Hachiman, and Keech indigenous lands. That university, California State University Fullerton, is categorized as a Hispanic serving institution as well as an Asian Pacific Islander and Native American serving institution. So those are two different um, federal distinctions. Um, the teaching load is very heavy, but my students are very awesome. So they're juggling working and raising siblings and caretaking for elders along with schoolwork. Um, and 30% of them are first generation college students or university students. Um, and I say all that just to explain that a lot of my research and thinking is necessarily intertwined with my teaching as um, I think you'll see, especially in the second part of this talk. So I thought it might be interesting to start by hearing directly from my students. Um, so last week I asked students in my queer literature and theory course during a unit, unit on queer ecologies to write um, personal anonymous narratives in which they described how they see their gender and sexuality intersecting with climate change or any other environmental issue. Um, so it was a, a very open-ended prompt. And here are um, excerpts from some that, that really jumped out at me. Um, so one student said, I'm glad I'm gay because I can't fathom bringing a new life into this mess. Another student, um, and actually I should say, I asked them, of course, for permission to share these um, you know, even though they're anonymous. And one student said, my only concern is that I, I do want you to say my name. So that's why the, the second student is giving credit here. So um, Paige says, I'm a gender fluid, demisexual, biromantic person. I relate to the idea of climate change as people truly don't believe it exists. People, even those in the LGBTQIA plus community don't believe my identity exists or should be part of the community. Um, another student said, um, I don't like to show skin at all. I find that it's harder for me to find clothing I can wear now that temperatures are increasing due to climate change. Um, and we've had some really bad um, heat waves. So it's gonna be 93 degrees Fahrenheit today um, when I go to work right after this. So, um, and then finally, another student said, in a way, I feel like the world is going to end soon. The weather is bipolar. Is winter even coming? The world doesn't feel right, so it makes me not want to use this time to find a significant other or even have kids. What's the point right now? Who knows if it'll ever feel right? This feeling makes me want to just appreciate what I have right now. Um, I think what strikes me the most um, is that these students are expressing really complicated and kind of surprising um, feelings. So the last comment really swerves from apocalypticism to a kind of contentment. Um, I just want I want to just appreciate what I have right now. I'm also interested in how these students um, gendered, queer, trans, and asexual spectrum identities shape and are being shaped by climate change. So climate change makes that um, first student glad they're gay. <laughs> um, another feels, the, the second student page, feels a kind of um, empathy with climate change itself, which is something I, I never um, could have imagined myself. And um, because I'm a, a close reader, uh, English type person, I'll point out that um, these brackets here where it says my identity, she had originally written it, and then the first time she says it, she's actually talking about climate change. So there's kind of like this blurring between climate change and her um, herself. Um, so these narratives are not directly um, related to what I'll be discussing in, in the rest of my talk, but they, um, you know, they speak to obviously, um, you know, emotion as it relates to climate change. Um, and I think they also help introduce the idea of, of queer and trans ecologies more broadly which is my general framework for today, as well as um, they also speak to the topic of time, which is something I'm interested. Um, so these students are concerned about the present as well as the future. Um, and one last uh, scene setting thing before I officially <laughs> get into the, the promise talk. I think it's worth mentioning that um, while I'll be working with a lot of trans culture makers in this talk, I don't personally identify as trans, um, but I also always think about trans studies scholar Eva Hayward's quip that she's never met a cisgender person. Um, here is my official talk in the form of a polemic. Ecofeminism, the environmental humanities, and affiliated movements must center trans ecologies. 
I make this declaration at a time of renewed assaults on transgender human rights. For instance, nearly 300 pieces of anti-trans legislation have been introduced in the United States since 2021. Alabama doctors who prescribe hormones for trans youth face felony charges and 10 years in prison, while Missouri recently considered banning gender transitioning for adults. Obviously, such measures have fomented anxiety and depression, as well as anger and fortitude amongst trans folks and their families and friends. But this is also a moment of possibility when contemporary culture makers are imagining new features of cis-trans solidarity, cross-species sensitivity, and trans mutual aid. These imaginings respond to climate change and other environmental crises, thereby reminding us that these crises are driven in the first place by colonial cis heteropatriarchy. So therefore by trans ecologies, um, I refer less to an academic subfield, though that's something that exists and, and is growing, and more broadly to ways of thinking and acting that oppose cis heteronormativity and support collective flourishing for all. I'll proceed by way of three interrelated subclaims, drawing primarily on the work of three US culture makers. And those are the Latinx trans poet, Oliver Baez Bendorf on the left, white trans writer, Callum Angus in the middle, and non-binary Chinese American artist, Mary Magic on the right. So subclaim number one, cis normativity is literally killing the planet. In a recent poem titled, Who Profits from This Feeling? Bendorf writes, quote, Gender is like a cone of light opening outward. Some people are so obsessed with revealing gender that it becomes a kind of constriction on an otherwise open flow of solar rays, end quote. Bendorf's reference to revealing gender brings to my mind the phenomenon of gender reveal parties, um, pre-birth announcements that, uh, sorry, pre-birth events that announce whether a gestating fetus is male or female. Obviously, such events emerge from cisnormative and heteronormative ideas, including that gender is binary and that one's gender at birth is a stable and significant category, determining how a child is raised and received, received and raised. We could certainly laugh off such events as unwitting cis hetero kitsch, um, but they have significantly darker sides, including multiple deaths, injuries, and environmental catastrophes. Um, in 2020, for example, a pyrotechnic device sparked a wildfire at El Dorado Ranch Park in Southern California that eventually destroyed five homes, burned 23,000 acres across two counties, and killed a firefighter. Three years earlier in Arizona, another gender reveal party stunt sparked the sawmill fire, which burned 47,000 acres. And all this sounds, um, you know, kind of ridiculous, just the, the scale of devastation versus the, the sort of, um, you know, mundane <laughs> sort of party uh, aspect. But, but the ridiculousness, I think, is kind of the point. The obsession with strict ideas of gender and sexuality is indeed quite ridiculous, and it is harmful to the non-human world as well as to humans. In fact, if we return to Bendorf's um, line, lines, I think we can see a version of this idea. He writes that revealing gender becomes a kind of constriction on an otherwise open flow of solar rays. Here, cisnormativity constrains nature. While a gender reveal fire, as the El Dorado fire became colloquially known, is an admittedly rare occurrence, we don't have to look far to find other examples of my first subclaim. So one might be the recent rise in mega truck purchases in the United States. Um, Consumer Reports found a huge scaling up over the last 20 years with the hood height of passenger trucks increasing by an average of at least 11% by 2000 and new pickups growing 24% heavier on average from 2000 to 2018. <clears throat> Mega trucks are often an expression of traditional white cisgender heterosexual masculinity, and they kill pedestrians at a much higher rate than other vehicles, as well as you know, slowly killing the planet with their massive fossil fuel consumption, or not so slowly. They therefore exemplify what has come to be known as toxic masculinity, or to put a finer point on it, heteromasculinity, to borrow a phrase from political scientist Cara Daggett. As she tells us, quote, white conservative American men, regardless of class, appear to be amongst the most vociferous climate deniers, as well as leading fossil fuel proponents in the West. Or as data analyst Tyson Jomini told Consumer Reports a bit more euphemistically, quote, trucks could look less tough, but you, meaning a given company, don't want to be the one to make your truck look soft. He estimates that car manufacturers make up to five times more money on trucks than sedans, 
because manufacturing the former is simpler and because you can charge a lot for the capability um, for the image. While the aforementioned are recent phenomena, it's um, so the, the consumer report said, you know, over the last uh, 20 years or so, the, the mega truck thing has been happening. It's crucial to remember the longer histories that inform them. Just as heteronormativity is a colonial project, so is cisnormativity. And I'm drawing on um, queer indigenous studies, this uh, collection from a couple of years ago. As many thinkers have shown, the colonial imposition of strict gender norms and sexual practices on indigenous populations, um, so things like monogamy, short hair for men, modest, quote unquote, modest dress, and the stigmatization of third gender individuals coincided with and continues to undergird the privatization and exploitation of land into single family settler parcels. Given all of the above, um, ecofeminists and environmental humanists must acknowledge the role that cisnormativity and heteronormativity and colonial cisnormativity and heteronormativity specifically play in driving, pun somewhat intended, environmental crisis. And we should prioritize the teaching and study of texts that allow us to examine this role. Um, okay, so on to subclaim number two, gender is a process, not a product. And here's where um, uh, sort of the, the interest in time um, that I have in this talk is gonna, gonna come in more pointedly. Okay, so implicit in the critique of gender reveals is the insight that gender is not pre-given. Um, and this is a longstanding insight, of course, you know, so um, most of you probably know uh, Simone de Beauvoir's 1949 declaration that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman, um, which influenced post-structuralist feminists such as Judith Butler. But I wanna think through this point in different ways, um, including conceiving of gender as ecological in the sense of relational and collaborative, as well as in the more literal sense of involving nature. U.S. writer Callum Angus's 2021 short story collection, A Natural History of Transition, helps us with such conceptions. One story in this collection, Rock Jenny, imagines a person who changes, who transitions genders and then ontologies, turning into a, a sedimentary rock formation that hosts hosts lichen, um, and then as the story closes um, many years later, the moon. Angus thus fancifully illustrates the idea that as one of my students put it in our fall 2021 class, gender transitions are not one and done. Or as Bendorf puts it in another recent poem, uh, I, which is titled, I just chose my place and let the circle form around me, quote, surely gender is far stranger than we've imagined and much more beautiful unfurling over decades, a phenomenon. Angus and Bendorf place gender within much larger time scales than the neat and clean mainstream narratives of transitioning often suggest, which again is um, an important corrective to the literally environmentally disastrous cis heteronormative idea of gender as pre-given. Deep time thinking and feeling are also key to climate justice as an antidote to exploitative, short-sighted and individual-centered Anglo-Western ideology. Um, and in fact, some indigenous thinkers have um, critiqued how framing climate change as an emergency often allows for leapfrogging over the kin making and deliberation that are crucial for energy transitions. As Potawatomi scholar Kyle Powis White puts it in his critique of how indigenous peoples have been shut out of solar, uh, solar energy negotiations, quote, states of emergencies become opportunities to undercut justice, end quote. Um, so again, I'm really interested in this idea of sort of um, how these trans culture makers are asking us to think um, in longer, longer timescales. Um, to go back to Rock Jenny, uh, Angus's story. I'm also interested in how um, a literary work like this centers non-human agency, dynamism, and sensitivity, uh, given that the titular Jenny has subjectivity and a voice throughout the story. Um, so here are just a couple exemplary moments. Um, so the narrator states that rocks like Jenny have great waves inside of them, like the ocean, only slower. Deeper still, she carried on thinking in rhythms indecipherable to passersby. Um, and later, Jenny verbally tells her partner, her family and her partner, quote, I thought I wanted to be a mountain, so meaning the rock formation, um, but why not the moon? So she's obviously literally given a voice here, um, even though she's no longer human. Um, and also, as my students pointed out to me, um, I didn't think about this when I first read it, but um, 
the moon, so she becomes the moon at the end of the story. The moon is an entity that cycles in and out of different um, phases perpetually, or at least we perceive it as doing so. So that's part of Angus's trans ecologies as well, to show that ongoing transitions are common across humans and non-humans. Um, and I think all this engagement with um, deep time is also interesting for how it updates existing frameworks of queer and trans temporality, which have tended to emphasize the ephemeral and the fleeting in opposition to heterofamilial logics of reproduction and legacy. Um, so as, as um, some in the audience um, may already know quite well, um, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, queer theorists began imagining quote unquote queer time or queer temporalities in explicit, explicit opposition to straight or normative time. Um, so uh, Jose Esteban Munoz um, states, instead of being clearly available as visible evidence, queerness has existed as innuendo, gossip, fleeting moments and performances that are meant to be interacted with by those within its epistemological sphere while evaporative at the touch of those who would eliminate queer possibility. Um, and likewise, um, Jack Halberstam has um, pointed to specific crises as fomenting new temporalities. Um, I'm not gonna read this whole quotation, but um, basically Halberstam is saying that the, the AIDS crisis um, prompts gay men in particular to rethink the conventional emphasis on longevity and futurity. While these particular visions of queer time have been foundational in validating queer life ways, um, they create something of a mismatch with environmental ethics, and that's something I've also written about um, elsewhere, not to mention allowing cis, uh, conservative cishet practices of ephemerality, such as um, the planned obsolescence of consumer goods, off the hook. Um, and here I'm, I'm going to quote um, my co-author. Um, I'm, I'm working on a, a piece that talks about this stuff with um, another person named Van Basten um, de Arujo. And he writes, um, although the sense of an environmental crisis is imprinted through the discourse of emergency and the necessity of actions in the immediate present, in the end, what is at stake in our current environmental policies are politics that deal with a bigger time frame. Thus, environmental thinking invites queer theory and trans theory to reconsider their time attachments, bringing them closer to disciplines such as archaeology, geology, and environmental history, end quote. Um, I should also add here that I think this, um, this kind of scaling up or out um, that both Bendorf and Angus are, are doing undercuts the moral panic around uh, detransitioning that drives so much um, transphobic discourse. And it also acknowledges people who transition later in life. So again, if you're, you're sort of um, uh, opening out what you think of as a, a, a time scale of trans experience, then that's um, uh, validating um, late in life transition. So simply put, it might take a lifetime or longer for someone to figure out their identity, and that's okay, they seem to argue. Um, and actually part of the humor of um, Angus's Rock Jenny story, and I um, haven't really gotten in, into what makes the story funny, um, but I think um, something she's doing, so basically her, her partner and her parents are very um, accepting when she says she wants to become a woman, but then when she says she wants to become a rock, they're like, oh, whoa, whoa, that's, <laughs> that's crazy, right? So I read this as kind of like a, um, almost like a satire of kind of like the supposedly supportive liberal parent who um, kind of gets attached to their queer trans kids' um, new identity and then can't allow them to um, change further or, or be more complicated. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, I love you, um, you know, whatever you are, but what are you again? You know, <laughs> be, be clear about your identity and be stable. Um, okay, anyway. So to wrap up this point, these culture makers, Bendorf and Angus, develop a vision of trans ecology that entails thinking and feeling across time scales, as well as across categories of gender and species. Importantly, Angus's work indicates that gender is a process for all humans, cis, trans, and otherwise. In highlighting this point, I don't mean to collapse uh, cis and trans experience or to downplay the unique struggles of existing in a transphobic society. Um, however, as my students and I discussed um, when I taught this um, Angus's collection, when we think of cis and trans in relation rather than as opposites, we can build solidarity and coalition, we can obviate the labeling of one as natural and the other as unnatural, and we can articulate the notion of gender as a spectrum rather than as two binary points. Another Angus story titled In Kind helps us see these things most clearly. The story switches back and forth between the perspective of a trans man undertaking a pregnancy, 
um, which produces a cocoon that begins to hatch at which the story ends. And so <laughs> like ends on this very unsettling but interesting note. Um, so it goes back and forth between the perspective of the pregnant trans man and that of his cisgender mother who is declining from breast cancer. In its very form then, the story parallels rather than opposes cis and trans experience. My students and I also identify parallels in the story content, such as how pregnancy and cancer both involve cellular growth, how both characters undergo invasive medical procedures, and how both characters um, obviously experience pregnancy across their lifetimes. And in fact, this um, shared experience forms a common ground upon which the formerly estranged family members repair their relationship. My students and I came to several conclusions in discussing this story, including that genders are produced through processes of self and other care, not just medical processes, that genders change as we age, and that trans bodily procedures and developments often overlap with cis bodily procedures and developments. Um, in fact, um, this story's um, cis mother slash trans child relationship um, recalls for me Julianne Peters 2004 young adult novel Luna, um, which I've, I've talked about this in, in um, previous work, but um, uh, it uses the biological family to question the sexist assumption that only transgender people modify their bodies or perform identity. Um, so for example, um, this novel includes a scene in which the mother of the um, transgender girl who's, who's named Luna tells her doctor's office that she needs an early refill on her estrogen, presumably um, for menopause. We might recall here US comedian Becca O'Neill's recent tweet um, declaring that most things cis women consider self-care are really just gender affirming practices. We should also think of Eva Hayward's work on Premarin, um, which used to be a um, standard hormonal treatment for trans women and importantly, uh, cis women and non-binary folks going through menopause. Um, and believe it or not, this um, this pill, this product, um, consisted primarily consists primarily of conjugated estrogens isolated from mare's urine. Um, so Premarin, unbelievably, is short for pregnant mare's urine. Um, so it's just a, it's a really <laughs> really instructive uh, uh, name. So um, so in her piece um, where she talks about Premarin, um, Hayward uh, includes this poetic reflection in italics. Quote. As elements of mere urine course through me, I am sensitized to the fact that animals and other non-humans are everywhere in the city. She's um, writing about San Francisco. I become alert to forces and presences that had been concealed by my sensory habits. How many of us are engaged in some kind of trans speciation, end quote. So Hayward shows us that human gender often depends upon the non-human world for its instantiation. And further, I think she helps us think of gender not as a personal, individual, or even neoliberal finite achievement, but as a process that scales across populations as well as species. In fact, um, even in the more intimate and small scale work of trans culture makers, such as the late artist, Mark Aguhar, uh, we see similar interest in trans speciation. Um, so I've been working on this um, written piece of Aguhar's, which is basically a list uh, titled How to Stave Off Suicide for Another Couple Hours. The list includes items such as number two, buy beautiful plants that remind you of yourself and that need careful attention. Number six, consider the reality of hormones. And number 10, find a therapist you get along with and that you can afford. Despite her use of the term buy in number two, um, Agarhart clearly imagines the houseplant not as a commodity, but as an entity in relationship. So one that both takes, um, as we see with um, the word choice of need, and gives, as we see with the word choice of remind. So for Agahar, trans life is a matter of trans species relationship. And um, to pick up this, this thread of time that um, I think you've seen so far, um, we see here that even just another couple hours is a crucial extension of time, the literal difference between life and death. So those couple hours might feel like an eternity, but they can and must be endured. Um, so as is probably quite clear <laughs> at this point or not, um, I'm interested in theorizing the larger potentialities of the term trans as partly decoupled from gender and as both verb and adjective. 
Um, and I'm not sure if um, anyone listening has um, been following this, but um, because of these kinds of insights I just mentioned, um, folks started adding um, a hyphen or sometimes an asterisk to the word trans starting um, actually like over, over 10 years ago. And I think that's fallen out of fashion a little bit, or at least it's not like the most exciting thing in the world um, today. But um, I think the discourse around it is, is still really important. Um, so as Mel Chen has declared, quote, trans with hyphen is not a linear space of mediation between two monolithic autonomous poles, as for example, female and male are, rather it is more emergent than determinate. Similarly, Susan Stryker, Paisley Kura, and Lisa Jean Moore have stated that the hyphen in trans marks the difference between the implied nominalism of trans and the explicit relationality of trans, which resists premature foreclosure by attaching to any single suffix, um, such as gender. Other like-minded scholars have uh, retained the connotations of movement and interrelationship implied by the prefix trans, um, which means uh, across or beyond. For example, Myra Hurd observes that the concept of trans works equally well both within, sorry, between and within matter, confounding the notion of a well-defined inviolable self that has undergirded Western culture. So um, basically I'm interested in trans as in transgender, but also trans as in trans species, and perhaps also um, as in trans temporality. The aforementioned uh, creators and thinkers have inspired me to examine my own practices of transing and specifically of gendered self-care, um, such as my use of hormonal birth control to alleviate debilitating menstrual cramps. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about what makes this transing um, in just a few minutes. It wasn't until, uh, until I started working on um, this piece that um, I actually bothered to look into the ingredients of my daily pill, Lutera, and those ingredients turn out to be levonorgestrel, um, a synthetic version of the quote unquote female hormone progesterone, and ethanol estradiol, or EE, which is a synthetic hormone. In addition to birth control, EE has also been used in menopause treatment, um, in hormone therapy for trans women, and as palliative care for people with prostate cancer, among many other uses. With this knowledge, I both recognize my cis privilege in terms of easy access to and obliviousness um, about such treatment and see myself in relation to others, male and female, cis and trans and otherwise. Okay, um, so last, third and last um, subclaim here um, is that DIY and crowdsourced hormones are mutual aid. Stockpiling and crowdsourcing of prescription hormones in order to circumvent medical gatekeeping is nothing new for transgender people. But as we reach this particularly grim and cruel juncture in US politics, um, defined as I suggested earlier by the overlap of codified cisnormativity slash transphobia and environmental destruction, these practices have taken on new urgency. On April 22nd, 2022, Twitter user G. Edgar Stout tweeted, cis men, it is time to start asking your doctor for a testosterone prescription and giving it to your local trans man or mask to stock up. I am not kidding, we need this. Um, so unlike estrogen, testosterone is um, considered a con controlled substance in the U.S. and is regulated um, much more intensely. This call exemplifies the idea of cis and trans alliance to which I gestured earlier. But while the problem of lack of access to hormones is certainly grim, at least one person, the non-binary artist Mary Magic, has taken a comedic approach to it. In 2017, they produced a speculative video titled Housewives Making Drugs, um, that combines the format of the cooking show with the aesthetic of the 1950s sitcom to imagine a DIY biohacking scenario in which transgender women extract estrogen from their own urine rather than relying on pharmaceutically produced hormones. Um, and pointedly, they um, then share the estrogen as needed. Um, and I'm happy to maybe during q and I can drop a link um, to this video, but I figured um, in the interest of time, I'd, I'd just describe it. Um, so they basically um, do a demo of how this works with their little contraption here. Um, the audience members in the studio, ooh and ah in goofy and supportive ways as the housewives demonstrate their process. Um, and at one point they say, quote, sharing hormones means tapping into new systems of interdependent community and taking the phrase sharing is caring to a whole new level, end quote. Um, effectively speaking, we might compare Magic's work to that of Chrissy Vargas, 
um, who is the creator of the speculative and um, satirical Museum of Transgender History and Art or MOTHA. So this is not a real museum, but um, he works on sort of, um, you know, he creates these brochures and, and so forth. Um, as Vargas promises in a fictional pitch for additional museum facilities, quote, the Mother Cafe will offer top-notch affordable food. The majority of the menu will be made up of raw and vegan foods, selections that contain phytochemical, uh, sorry, phytohormone, I can't say this, <laughs> phytohormonal ingredients, naturally occurring hormones, will be highlighted in order to support and complement people's pharmacological and or herbal transitions, end quote. Um, so while Vargas is to a large extent joking, um, perhaps satirizing LGBTQ plus folks' politically correct eating habits, as well as the museum industrial complex, he nonetheless gestures toward the overlap between trans issues and environmental issues, while perhaps inadvertently reminding us that plant-based alternatives to Premarin exist. So according to the University of Rochester Medical Center, um, in fact, bioidentical hormones like those in my own birth control are produced in the laboratory from plants, um, including wild yams, cactus, and soy. So gender affirmations like my birth control regimen cannot take place without the help of the non-human world. And the lines between synthetic and natural are blurred in the process. Um, okay, just two more paragraphs, um, in case you're wondering. Um, so back to Mary Magic. Um, Magic is affiliated with the speculative project Open Source Gender Codes from artist Ryan Hammond, also known as Ryan Ciela Hammond. This um, project description states that um, by developing novel sex hormone production technologies and dedicating them to the public domain, OSG, uh, so that is open source gender codes, attempts to queer current regimes of ownership and biopower. End quote. Um, neither Magic's nor Hammond's visions are quite possible yet. So these are these are fictional sort of speculations. Um, but they nonetheless gesture toward possible and crucial features of mutual aid across gender identities, um, not unlike what we see in Angus's fiction. In fact, at the initial project stage, Hammond stated, quote, I am not trans. I am a queer person who is interested in science and interested in the way science has historically and still is trying to regulate sexuality and gender expression, end quote. And these visions scale gender transitioning on a community rather than corporate or medical industrial level. Um, okay, so I wanna wrap up by saying um, a few pointed things about speculation. Uh, each culture maker I've focused on today speculates in their own way. So Bendorf and Angus by thinking and feeling in long time scales that project toward the future. Magic, obviously by imagining citizen science projects or practices that have not yet come to fruition. Angus's relatively realist uh, fiction also dips into science fiction with the introduction of elements like the cocoon in, in Kind and of course the ontological transitioning in Rock Jenny. And I also mentioned how figures um, like Mark Aguhar project into the future as a matter of life and death. Such speculative moves remind me of Adrian Marie Brown's statement that quote, I believe all organizing, meaning political action is science fiction, that we are shaping the future we long for and have not yet experienced. We are part of a natural world that is constantly changing and we need to learn to adapt together and stay in relationship if we hope to survive as a species. And of course, as species plural, um, end quote. So as environmental crises worsen in conjunction with anti-trans ideology, these features of solidarity, sensitivity and mutual aid that I've sketched out today are what I think we all must dream of. Thank you. Thank you.